um, this morning, our learning together. I want to just begin by uh, thanking Dr. Mark Brandris and Nancy Eisenberg for sponsoring uh, this morning's Shear class in commemoration of the yard site of his beloved father, Rabbi Joseph Brandris, Rav Yosef Meir Ben Harav Chaim David. Thank you so much for your sponsorship and the schus and the merit of Limud HaTor Chabi and Elias Neshama for him, a merit for your entire family. We thank you for your generosity and uh, we look forward to learning here together uh, this morning and for many occasions together in the future. All right, so thank you, Jason, for sharing the source material, which are in the chat. If anybody does not have it, um, please uh, let us know. We'll be able to uh, get it to you via uh, sending an email. The purpose of... Okay, let's just close that. Okay, the purpose of these source materials are really for you to be able to have them as a reference guide, and certainly you could take notes if you print them and uh, ask questions along the way. What you will see that we've done, if you'll notice, is that there, there are new materials that exist to the original sheets. So this way we're filing add-ons to the source of material that we shared over previous weeks so that at the end of this topic, you'll be able to print the whole thing uh, and then have all the sources as one, as one like compound concept. Um, but the idea would be to this way not to have, to have you staple them and to keep tr track and record of them. Um, if you want to print them, of course, and use them, then uh, feel free to do so. Um, but for now, uh, this way you have all the sources available. We'll just have, I added a number four, four more sources to the conversation that we started. And today we're going to focus a little bit more in extension of what we had spoken about previously, which is how much money does a person have to spend? How much does a person have to extend themselves? Are they able to uh, retrieve finances and funds from the next of kin, from the heirs, from the Yarshim? How much money does a person have to spend? Is there a limit to that? Is there ever a time where a person would say that, okay, because of the circumstance of maybe their uh, life would not be in the best uh, status, the best case, so therefore there's a limit to what it is? And that's part of what we left off last week, but just to review very briefly. So we uh, discussed in source number seven that the Gemara Mesecha Sanhedrin, which is reviewed seven through 11 and jump into 12, but quickly we'll do seven through 11. I just got a text message that the vote was seven uh, to zero to rescind the decision. So therefore, this principle is officially out. So that's a big celebration. It's the power of the Jewish voice. And it's no, the power of no, 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 no. They're going to rescind the decision, but then they're going to re-vote on it. They're rescinding what they voted on last time, and now it starts a re-vote. Really? Got it. I would that's imagine what, that, I would that's imagine, what, though, that, that, that that's, that's the writing on the... That's what Robinson said, that they start over now. It's like that never happened before, wow, which that's is peculiar. third. It's like, it's that's what my yeah. understanding when I just watched it. Wow. Yeah, that seems to be uh, wasteful, but okay. But it's, no, certainly... Rabbi, it's, it's not. It's, that's the way they have to do it. Because you can't, if you rescind the first vote, then there is no vote at all. So they won't right. go on record as taking a vote as to what to do. Right. I just don't know why they don't do it like right now. Why? why, why they might. Do they have... I don't know. Okay, got it. Sometimes they have internal rules about, you know, it's called Robert's right. rules about how to conduct themselves. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. All right. But listen, at, at the very least, I mean, we understand what the, what the indication is. That's the 7 to 0 indicator, which is good. I mean, these are the same people that are going to vote, right? I mean, the same people. Right. That... And I think, I think you have to assume, Rabbi, and I think you're correct that they wouldn't have rescinded the initial vote unless they wanted to change the outcome. Right, right, right. Yep, yep, yep. It's the power of the voice. It's the power of the person, right? It's the power of the people. I don't know. I think it's an incredible testament to what, what, what can happen. A, a couple of the members had said that they were told they couldn't change their vote. Yeah, I, read, I saw that. Yeah, I was watching that. I saw that. Okay. Well, maybe we're on the right track. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how they voted to uh, rehire to begin with. I, and I actually found that, that the, whole, the whole process was, was, was painful that it even needed to happen. In fact, I'll tell you privately that, I'm not so privately because it's going to be published, but, but the encouragement that, you know, that we all gave as a community to Mayor to be able to go do it because of how necessary. I mean, it was offensive to him and to us and to everybody that it even needed to happen. They should never have brought him to this. It should never have happened that way. But that's the system that we fought against. That's the voice that was loud, and that's uh, what we were able to pressure them to over, overturn. So that's that's, fan that's fabulous, fantastic. 
Yeah, Baruch Hashem. Okay, so we understood that generally speaking, the laws of damages are pretty clear. When a person breaks something, and even if the uh, damage, the breaking of whatever that object, whatever that kli, whatever that chefza is, even if it's done inadvertently, it's done accidentally. In fact, we have a concept of an adam is muad la'olam. Mod, adam muad la'olam means that in that case of even, let's just say in a situation, you're not expecting, you're not intending to do something. You stretch your hand out, you're waking up in the morning and you're a guest in someone's house and you happen to shatter the, the, the lamp, the clock that's next door, next to you on the nightstand. So the obligation you have is to pay. And the obligation you have to pay is pretty standard, is pretty specific to any situation, more or less, with rare exception. And as the Gemara in source number seven points out, that there is a special exception and a special exemption from payment for damages that are caused during a rescue mission, right? And the reason why, as the Gemara explained, is very simple. It's that it's not based on strict legal, you know, principles of damages, because strict legal principles of damages are very, spe- is very specific, that you break something, you damage something, you, you have some culpability, responsibility, you have to pay for it. But the reason is, is because if we do not rule this way, and this is a very important language, is because kol adam shematzalas chaveru miyad harodef. Because if we did not say that, it would come out that every not everybody would go run to save the other person because another person would be ambivalent. The person would be con- considerate of maybe what they're going to lose as a result of going on this rescue mission. So therefore, if I thought that even though I'm going to break something, I'm going to cause damage, I'm going to create a situation where I'm going to have an ob- a financial obligation. That ambivalence would put people's lives in peril. And so therefore, Chazal, which of course we know Torah is called a Torah Schaim, with this Gemara, with this Chazal, we understand that there was a sensitivity to understand that just the simple logic that a person would deploy, thinking that if I'm going to lose something, I'm not going to do it. So then obviously Chazal had to make that, that adjustment. And making that adjustment made it so that the next person is not going to be ambivalent about trying to help the next person. You're going to be protected in the law is going to allow you to recover your asset, recover the law, the assets that you and the monies that you that you put forth. So therefore, that's that's number one. So we see that's in source number seven, source number eight. We learned, learned that the Yad Ramana's commentary also that's based on what we learned previously is that we had two verses. If you remember, we learned that there are two biblical sources to teach us that you have an obligation. Number one is Lo Samur Al Damri Echa, do not stand by idly when somebody's blood, if you will, is being spilled. You have an obligation to do that. But we also learned from the Pesach and Pesach's Kiseitze, Kiseitze, which says that, Vosalo, that we have to return a lost article. And the Gemara understood what that meant is not just an article. It means like anything that's lost. If the person is lost, if the substance of that person's li- life is in, is in danger, so then you have to, just like it's a Kalvachomer, just like you have to return a person's lost items, you have to return a person's life. So you have two psukim. What are the two psukim coming to teach us? The two psukim are coming to teach us means that even in a situation where you don't think you could do it, where you're not skilled to do it, you don't have the wherewithal to do it, or maybe it's not something that it's even in your immediate proximity. You don't have the article to return, but you know about it. You know that there's something that's in danger. You still have an obligation. What's the, what's the expanse and the extent of that obligation? The extent of that obligation is that you have an obligation to hire other people, or in the case of you know, getting medical help, you have to make a phone call. You have to try to get the people that are able to take care of what needs to be taken care of to get to the scene and to be able to help the, the victim recover. So that's not only is it a situation where, for example, you have a, an article that you find, you're traveling outside and you're walking on the street and you see an article that has a sign on it. And you know that you have an obligation to return it. What happens if you learn about something that's not in your immediate proximity, you still have an obligation. Osam al damri echa obligates you to do anything and everything possible to hire somebody, to hire others, to make sure that other people are safe. Now, by extension, that means that you have an obligation to make sure that other people are doing the right thing. And obviously, we have to understand, like, who, who is the arbiter of what's called doing the right thing? So good. So we understand that on the, the Yad Ramaz comment in source number eight was that a person can, yes, of course, reclaim the money that he put out, but we also understood that he has an obligation to put up the money. You would might maybe possibly assume and conclude that you don't have an obligation to put it up. You have just... You know, you can reclaim it. But the answer is we see that from the fact that you can reclaim it, the obligation says the Yad Ramah is to put out the money to begin with. And so therefore that's very specific, which we understand from this is that you got to do whatever you can to help that person in that situation. But here's where things got a little bit interesting with source number nine is the commentary of the rush. And the commentary of the rush is really addressing a situation where somebody is destitute. Let's just say you have a victim who doesn't have the money. So does the obligation of the rescuer becomes still the, is it the same, or does it become compromised because maybe he doesn't have to put himself out? And that's what the rush says 
Hecha de Isle Mamona de Nazil, which means that the, really the law is, is that the person has to pay back the rescuer because as we learned previously, right? We learned previously that if, it, if we didn't say that, then it would be that nobody would rescue the next person. But what we understand is, and therefore, because of the fact that we see that that ability for him to reclaim his monies is there, that's the law. But what happens if he doesn't have money? So that's what the rush in his commentary on the Gemara says, that that's only assuming he has the money. But if he doesn't have the money, the, that, you know, that statement, which seems to be a little bit um, ambiguous of the rush, is that is where the person, where the rescued person has money, implies that a rescue party must save somebody in danger, even in a situation where that person doesn't have the money. And that obviously then comes to the moral value that a person has to be sure that they're so morally bound and morally committed to what the, what the explanation of this Gemara is and what Chazal is teaching us. So therefore the money is recovered where it can be recovered and where it can't be recovered, the rescuer has to spend their own money. And we'll see Rav Asher Weiss in his commentary and just some of the sources we're going to learn together. And that is in source number 10, where we learned that the Ramah, Rabbi Moshe Isulis, not to be confused with the Yad Ramah in the laws of redeeming captives, also, the concept of pigeon shvuyim. Now, how much money does a person have to spend? So you have to spend what you need to spend to get the person freed. You have to put it on your credit card. Are you able to recover the assets? Of course you're able to recover the assets. But that's only im isle l'shalim, says the Ramah. That's only if the person has what to repay. Meaning, if he didn't have what to repay, so then obviously he wouldn't be able, able to. And finally, not only that, that was source number 10. Now, source number 11, we learned in Shulchan Aruch HaRav, in the laws of bodily damages, you can't hesitate to save the life even, of a, even for a moment of a poor person. And if you do, if you can reclaim the money, good. If you can't, look at the end of that, Vimlav, Lo Yimna. I mean, you can't hold yourself back from helping that person. And if nimna, and if you did hold yourself back, over you would be in violation. You would be the, the perpetrator. You would be the one who's evil. And they have that sometimes in other areas of Allah as well. So take, for example, somebody in the laws of tshuva, laws of repentance. Somebody has wronged you, and that person owes you an apology. So that person comes to you and asks for forgiveness. And I'm talking about sincere forgiveness. There's not ulterior motives. There's no agendas. That person asks forgiveness sincerely. So the obligation they have is to do so three times, genuinely, sincerely. Let's say a person comes to you, and the first time you just, uh, you're not ready to, to accept their apology, and they uh, are, not, are not given that slicho mechila. The second time they have to come to a different location at a different time and ask you again. And if the Second time doesn't prove successful, it has to be a third time. Now, the third time they come and they ask you for forgiveness and you still feel, you know, strongly about not forgiving them and you don't forgive them, so then what's the din? What's the law? The Allah is, the Rambam writes, and then you have a new sinner. Who's the new sinner? The Chotan now is you because we have an obligation to try to help other people be as successful as possible and we have to forgive them. Now, obviously, that obviously that brings into conversation is there ever a situation where there's an Avera sin that's unforgivable? Not our topic for right now, but the assumption, of course, is, is that when a person tries so hard to ask for forgiveness and it's genuine and sincere, you see that there can be a situation where a person will become the sinner because of their failure to, to give forgiveness to that person. Another area in halacha, let's just say, for example, somebody asks you, the Gabbai asks you to be the shlich tzibor, to lead the services. So the law is that the first time the shlich tzibor asks you, you have to say no. Because if you would run to the Ummah, it would look like you're arrogant, as if you know, you're the right person to do it. The second time, you can equivocate, you can pause a little bit, you can look like you're thinking about it. And the third time, you have to run up to the Ummah, you have to take the Ummah. And if you didn't, it would look like you're you know, too good for it. So we see that there's sometimes status changes as it relates to circumstances as they are. So we see that the Shulchan Aruch HaRav points out that if a person does not help a destitute, destitute a poor person, that person then becomes the chote. That person then becomes, he's low, he's over, he's in violation of the Osam al damri Echa, and that is the law. Okay, so that's where we kind of left off last week. Any questions, comments, concerns about those points? Seems to be pretty straightforward. All right, let's jump off and pick up from source number 12. So, you know, when we ask ourselves the following challenging question, so how much money are you willing to spend to save a life? So again, as we mentioned, halachic, there are many halachic authorities that address the issue of how much money a person is obligated to spend for saving a life. And part of this conversation is going to then turn into how much money are you obligated to spend on anything, right? So even when we think about mitzvos, so yeah, you want to buy a lulav, you want to buy um, a mezuzah, you want to buy 
a talis, you want to buy any mitzvah, for example. So are you obligated to spend a certain amount of money? And that conversation ultimately actually is predicated on a pasuk in Chumash. What's the pasuk, the verse in the Torah that we say that one would be obligated to spend more money than what would seem to be like the average? And that's based on a pasuk in Parshas B'Shalach that we say every single day in the Shira. Zekeli van Veyu. Zekeli van Veyu is I will exalt, I will glorify, I will beautify. The Gemara says that means we'll beautify the mitzvah. So that means there's different levels. When you go to a proprietor and that person is selling mezuzahs or that's selling tefillin or selling anything for that matter, there's the regular, there's the better, there's the best. So a person should aspire to try to fulfill the mitzvahs in the precept of Zekeli van Veyu in the most beautified way. And that will mean that a person might have to spend more money. So you can get one esrog at this price, you get one mezuzah at this price. doesn't mean that it's not kosher, but you want to spend more money because you want to show that you want to beautify the mitzvahs by getting the best one possible. There are different standards, different gradations, and therefore that's what it is. So the same way there's a conversation as it relates to how much a person has to spend in halacha specific to a mitzvah, there's of course also what seems to be a conversation in halacha, the post can discuss and address the issue of how much a person is obligated to spend for saving a life. So for the purpose of fulfilling mitzvah in general, so the Ramah and Shulchan Aruch, when Archaim explains rules, that one need not spend more than one-fifth of one's assets. That's a very important law. That's also true with regards to tzedakah, and tzedakah has uh, other adaptations, other applications. You know, you don't have to go to the, you know, break your piggy bank to, to help support another uh, cause. You certainly can give more, but even giving more, is there a sense of, of, of arrogance that's associated with giving more than you're obligated to give? So with regards to mitzvahs, the person need not. Now that's the interesting language of the Ramah. You're not obligated. Does that mean you're allowed to? The answer is many people say you are allowed to, but you're not obligated to spend more than one-fifth of your assets with regards to the performance of a mitzvah. So the Ramah adds that this principle, this concept applies specifically to fulfilling a positive mitzvah. But for a negative mitzvah, a person must spend all of a person's money to avoid transgressing a prohibition. And that's where we see that there's a great divide between mitzvahs ase and los ase, do's and the don'ts. To fulfill a mitzvah, a, a lulav, an esra, a mezuzah, a mitzvah that you're going to do, a positive, an ase, so then you have a limit to how much you're supposed to spend. But there is no limit to how much you are supposed, you know, supposed to spend when a person is to avoid transgressing a, an avera, a lav, a prohibition. And that's a very important din. That's what the Ramos says. Now the question is how to look at the Torah's instruction of do not stand aside when your fellow's blood is being shed. Like when does that happen? At what point is that considered that that's a lav at the very beginning or is it literally that their life is in danger? Is it a very specific moment? When do you have to spend all your money? So the Minchas Usher in source number 12 explains that there are no limits to spend on spending to save a life. And I guess what that will mean, as we'll see, is that maybe we'll mean at the very beginning of this, even when you don't know that the life of that person is necessarily in danger. It might be that they're not in danger, but it's a possibility. The key word is it's suffake sakonis nefoshos. Maybe even if it's a doubt. Vihine netiyas alev habrura de al hatsolos hanefesh. Says it's my clear. It's was barura. It's it's clear in my heart. Barura means it's very very clear to me. Dal hatsolos hanefesh that to save a person's life, tzarech lahotzi kol mamoina. This is where Rav Asher Weiss writes, that this is one of the leading posts in, in today's generation, that a person has an obligation to, and that's what it's based on this Ramah, Rabbi Moshe Isolis. person has to be lahotzi kol mamona. That means you have to give up all your money. Dalom mitzvah zo doicha kol kula. Why? After all, we know that saving a life, of course, supersedes the entire Torah. And we, of course, know We know, does one not desecrate Shabbos in order to save a life, even though one has to be willing to lose all of his money to avoid desecrating Shabbos? We understand that. So even though one must lose all of their money so as to avoid the desecration of Shabbos, so nonetheless, one desecrates Shabbos, of course, to save a life. So therefore, we understand is all the more so a person has to spend all one's money to save a life. It's true. It's like this Kav It's obvious. So therefore, we understand is that according to a number of halachic authorities, well, the shitas mixas a poskim in Choshen Mishpat, sarich lehikonez l'sofek sakana k'dei lahatzil chaveiro. This is a very important statement here, which means according to most authorities, a good number of them, 
he writes mixas, but that really is translated as a, as a number of them, a, 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 a gathering of some. A person has to enter possible danger in order to save another person. Now we're going to get to what a person has to do. I know Dr. Seinfeld, you asked that question two weeks ago. We're going to get to that in another segment. But here he explains or just reference it, references it. It's not just that that person is in a situation of suffix sakana, but you yourself as the rescuer have to even, we're going to learn, have to enter into suffix sakana to save another person's life who that person is in danger. We're going to discuss that a little bit more later on. And so therefore we understand if one is permitted and obligated to endanger himself to save a life, then Kalvachomer ben Benosha and Kalvachomer, then certainly he's obligated to spend all of his money to save another person's life. That's what he explains. But Kalvachomer had umayim suffix sakonad nidches mishum hatzalos hanefesh kol shekein shechayev lahotzi kol mamono lahatzal nefesh chavero dechol asher lo yitain ba'ad nafsho. As all one has, a person has to give, he will give for his life. And that's also what we learned previously, Rav Moshe Feinstein was explaining, was we understood that if a person is going to willingly do anything to save their own life, certainly that is the paradigm that a person has to use to saving another person's life, which means it's not that we're going to say that there's an exemption in a situation where you would find it, you know, below your dignity to do something to save somebody's life. It's not below your dignity to do anything to save your own life. So then, therefore, we understand that life requires that even if it's an activity that's, quote, below your dignity to do, you still have to do it. And if it's below your dignity, so it seems to lose all your money because your life is going to have to be different as a result of having to lose all your money, again, this doesn't make this easy, but we're just learning the law. We're learning the din. We're learning the Shulchan Aruch. When the Shulchan Aruch says that, yes, of course, in the Russia's commentary, of course, you have to get your money back. You don't have to go into it thinking you're not going to get your money back. But maybe you do, which means that if it would be, it would turn out that you would not be able to get your money back. And even if you to spend an exorbitant amount of money to save a life or to help redeem a captive, so you have to do it. Now, will it be that somebody will be less likely Again, we have to remind ourselves that what we learned in the Gemara, that the reason why we say that there's a special, special exemption to, to uh, fi- finances being to damages that a person causes, that a person's not obligated to pay those damages. So similarly, we worry that if a person knows that they're going to have to pay for what they spent to you know, save another person's life and they're not going to be able to recoup that money, maybe that person's likewise going to also be a little bit hesitant. That's a reality that maybe a person is going to have to deal with. That's very scary. In fact, when I was speaking to a number of people about this topic, somebody reminded me of a, situ- a case in, in Borough Park where whether or not Hatzala was advised, Hatzala members was advised that it's permissible not only to go on the mission, but to come back from the mission. Now, if you did not say that it was permissible to come back up from the mission, then maybe there would be people who are Hatzala members, if they got a call on Shabbos, they were radioed to go to this address, but that address is much further than walking distance. So they would have to stay at the hospital for the the duration of the Shabbos, and maybe they'd be less willing to do it. It's a hard question. It's a good question. What is the difference between the the fact that the, the Gemara feels compelled to tell you that if you damage something, you're not obligated to pay because of the fact that if we're worried that if you thought you had to pay, you wouldn't go out on a rescue mission. And here where we're learning that the obligation to swallow the costs in a situation where you have a poor destitute victim, you as the savior have an obligation not only to put it on your credit card, but even in a situation where that person cannot repay you, you have to use that money. What's the difference? The answer is it's a very difficult question. That's a very, very hard question. What we're then re, we're, we're including in this conversation is a moral value system. A moral value system is, is that this is a very slight nuance, is that you have to go into it. Like you're not going to let a person, God forbid, die or even a possibility of their dying just because of the fact that you're worried about your, your bank account. And so therefore the morals that are necessary for a person to think about how to behave with somebody make it so and make it such that even though it seems to be you have two concepts that seem to be not in concert. They're really on a slight, in a very uh, specific way, they're distinct. Because here in the case of damages, you damage something already, and so therefore we're not going to obligate you. You didn't intend to damage those things, you were just running to help the victim. And as well, while you're running to help the victim, you tripped and fell and you broke his, his flask, you broke his jug, you broke his, you know, the, uh, the flower pot. So now the rabbis didn't obligate you to do something that you didn't intend to do to begin with. But as it relates to initiating that action, that activity that obligates you to go forward and to go towards the effort of trying to save somebody. So you have to do that. And even if it will mean 
that a person will lose all their money. So we understand from Rav Asher Weiss um, is that he mentions three authorities who also maintain that there is no 20% ceiling on the obligation to spend money to save life. Rav Yaakov Emdim in Shailas Yaivitz, the Aruch HaShulchan, and the Chafetz Chaim, as we'll see here, if you look at source number 13, in Ahavas Chesed, the Chafetz Chaim writes that it seems, Venire, it seems that this, what he's referring to, is the one-fifth limit on stucca charity. Again, and that's, as I mentioned, just parenthetically, but there is a limit to how much even a person is supposed to do. You don't have to put yourself into a situation where you need charity from somebody else because you gave so much charity. Believe it or not, there was a, and we had cases like this in the Gemara. There was a case of Shalom Bias that a number of years ago I was dealing with, and literally the, the wife felt that the, the husband was putting them in such a situation. He was saying, I'm so utterly generous because I want to just give to every organization. But meanwhile, they couldn't pay their bills. I was trying to explain to him that that's not the definition of generosity. It certainly maybe comes from a place of generosity, but there's a limit. So the Chavetz Chaim writes in source number 13, it appears to me that this, this one fifth limit on stuck at charity spending applies in a situation that does not relate to actually saving a life. That is what he says. That it's she'ein no geel lefikuach nefesh mamish. It's not talking about that, right? That, that's 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 a different category. But if it relates to someone whose life is truly in danger, where, for instance, the captive is on the verge of death, or the hungry person is on the verge of death because of his hunger, so the limit of one fifth is not applicable. Now, what's interesting is if you dissect those words, aval im no geel lefikuach nefesh mamish kigon shehash shvui oimid lamus or this, this concept of one fifth. What we understand here is that this concept of one fifth, this principle does not apply. And the fact that the Gemara says that only that one's life takes precedence over another person's life, where one is faced with a tragic option of whether, of either saving his own life or another person's life, but, right, so that's, that, that's where you're going to have a conversation of whether you're allowed to enter into a situation where you know for sure your life is in danger. And even a situation of Suffolk, we're going to see that that's part of the conversation that we're going to have uh, eventually, like how far do you have to go? What if your life is in danger? That's the Gemara Bava Metziah, Folio 62, where the Gemara says that your life is chai, that chai of kodim chai of chavero, that your life is, of course, takes precedence over another person's life. That's where a person, again, has that tragic option of either saving his own life or another's. But we don't find that one's wealth takes precedence over a person's life, meaning it's only where life is li- and life and life are equivocated. And that's in a situation, a very specific case. And we're going to see that that does apply. We will learn that let's just say you know that you're going to go into a crowd to try to save a victim from marauding uh, thieves and thugs. And you know, and again, that's also part of the, is it objective or subjective? You know, for as best as you can imagine, that if you go into that, you're going to die. So you don't have to put yourself in that situation. If it's a suffix, that's where the Shulchan Aruch rules. If it's suffix, a kind of So then, just like there's a doubt that you could, there's also a doubt that you won't. So therefore, the doubt that you won't, according to many posts, and according to many halachic decisors, indicates whereby a situation should go, a person should go put themselves in that situation. But what we understand from this source, from the Chavetz Chaim, uh, Rav Yisrael Meir Kagan HaKohen and Avas Chesed here, is that that one-fifth spending limit does not apply to saving a life. You have to spend as much as you can. The concept of your, all your wealth versus all your life, so then uh, that, that those, those cases are not the same. Now, you know, anybody who's a student of the Chumash, a Bible a linguist, a studier of, of just the Midrashim, Chazal, you'll understand that there's a famous question on this famous question on this what's the famous question on this famous question on this about wealth and taking precedence we said the Chavaz Chaim said we do, we have not found that one's wealth takes precedence over one life because obviously the assumption is that life is life and wealth is wealth right but what's the one famous well-known kasha one well-known question on this the famous well-known question of the on this if you remember that uh when Eliphaz who was the son of um, of Esav was running in hot pursuit. Remember, running in hot pursuit to capture Yaakov Avinu to co- capture Uncle Jacob. So when he was taking flight and he was leaving because he knew that Esav was hunting him and wanted to kill him, was predicting his own de- the death and the demise after his their mother would 
um, would, would die or after the parents would die or even after Yitzchak specifically was going to die. So he was going to run in hot pursuit. So his son, Eliphaz, ran after him. Now here's the, the difference though, is that he ca- comes and he's able to catch up to him. But as a student of Yaakov, as he was, Eliphaz, he was very close to his uncle. So he caught up to him. And he didn't know what to do. He asked him the kasha. Rashi quotes his famous chazal. What's the chazal? He didn't know what to do. On one hand, I have an obligation of kabi es avicha, kibudav vaim, to honor my father. My father said, if I catch you, I have to kill you. Now, obviously, we know in halacha that if a parent tells you to do something that's a violation, a prohibition, you don't have to listen. Parent says, child, I want you to violate the Sabbath to come visit me or to do this, that, the other thing. Child does not have to do that. In fact, is obligated through the Torah precept Shomor Shabbos, and then Kabin Zavicha Vasimech, you have to keep the commandments, follow Hashem first. So, in the case of Eliphaz, who found, uh, you know, the company of Yaakovin was able to catch up to him, so he didn't know what to do. Imagine that, Shaila. If I listen to my father, I have to kill you. So, what should I do? I don't want to kill you. You're my uncle. I know that I know better. So, he said to him, anybody remember what he said to him? He said to him, just here, I'll give you all my wealth. I'll give you all my money because a, a poor person is like a dead person. And therefore, you will have fulfilled your father's request. Here, you'll take all my money, you'll take all that I have, and I'll be dead. I'll be dead in the eyes of your, your physical obligation to fulfill your father's uh, command. And therefore, you can be said of me that I'm a dead person. So if we're going to tear, which of course we are, life and wealth, and therefore we, as the Chavetz Chaim says, there isn't a situation where wealth trumps uh, life, obviously, but in such a situation, there are those who posit that you have a situation where a person being impoverished, and therefore if you spent all your money, it's as if you died, and if you died, then you're putting yourself in a situation where your death and that person's death are now together, and obviously it's a conversation. Now we know that there's this, you can't compare a person's physical death maybe to a spiritual or a social or emotional death, and that's how some others uh, get out of that, but just wanted to share that obvious um, challenge to the principle, okay? But we understand that Rabbi Usher Weiss concedes that under ordinary circumstances, Again, that's where we're going to have to define ordinary circumstances versus precarious and highly precarious circumstances. One would never have to sell one's house for the purpose of saving a life. That's what he says. The reason for this is that the obligation to save a life does not apply specifically to one person, but to the entire community. And this is a huge difference. You know, when you have a rallying call of a whole community, it's not one person. So therefore, it wouldn't be that you should be in a situation where you know about it. And therefore, since you knew about it first, you got the Facebook feed, you got the text message, the email first, you know, this person's in danger. So you got it first. Therefore, you have to bear the burden of the whole, the, the whole cost. No, no, no. The obligation, says Russia Weiss, is that the circumstances would never put you in a situation where you have to sell your whole house. You have to come up with the sum total of what the money requires. That's the concept of pigeon shui, right? We've all seen that there's all these campaigns, you know, pigeon shui to raise money for someone who's who's sick, who's in the hospital, has raised money for, for medications. I think if you remember a number of years ago, I spoke about Atish above, there was a huge amount of money that was needed in a relatively short period of time to give a small child a dosage, one dose that was going to save their life within a su- super small proximity. They needed to raise like $1.2 million, which was like an obscene amount of time in the short amount of time that they were given, a, short, a huge amount in a short period of time to raise the money. And what they did is they had this campaign that the entire community came you know, anybody gave from a dollar to much more, obviously, and they were able to do it because the obligation is not just for Russia Weiss, but other posts can explain that when it comes to saving a life, the obligation is not on the yachid, it's not on the individual, but it's on the kahal, it's on the community. And so therefore, if all share the burden, nobody will have to sell their houses. Now, the problem, though, of course, is that not everybody is willing to share the burden. Some people choose that they're not going to. They're going to turn their face and they'll be in violation of the Samar al-Dam because the obligation requires that the kila has to do it, which means if there's a call for... $100, and there's 100 members of the community, everybody's going to give a dollar. So that one person who doesn't forces other people to give more money. That person is in violation of the Samar Adam But look at source number 14. These last two sources of today is the Mincha Zosha writes, again in Bereshis, that Amnon Zerak Bemikra Kitsoini Shu Levada Yochola Azar. That only in very ex- exceptionally unusual, extreme cases, where he's the only person to save somebody, then you have to spend all your money. So that's why, that's how we understand the difference between, you know, your, your putter, you're exempt from damages. And therefore, the rabbis understood that if you didn't do that, people would not go on the next call. And here it seems to be you're obligated to spend all your money. The answer is that Chazal didn't expect you to spend your own money because Chazal expected you to share the burden with everybody else in the community. Other people to share your burden and, other, and you to share the, other, the burden of others. Because if it wasn't the case, then no one would help anybody, obviously, right? It's the same logic. It can't be a different 
defying logic than what we just previously we learned to begin this talk and what we learned last week as well. But there is a situation, says Rav Asher Weiss, that in source 14, maybe there, there is still the, the concept that's out there, which would mean if you were on a deserted island or if you were in a situation where literally nobody else is willing to help, right? It's funny, you know, when you do a campaign and other people are asked to help and they don't help, so they're obligating you to do something more that you would yourself not have to do. Like I'm always, let's think about even like tuition assistance. If everybody was able to pay tuition, then the people that pay tuition and have to now pay more than the amount of tuition, the cost of the education, it would obviously go less. It would be, it would be diminished if everybody paid it. Now, if everybody was able to pay it, I'm not talking about the cost of tuition, but theoretically, if everybody was able to carry their weight, then not everybody would have to pay more. You have this dues for a synagogue. Sure, if everybody was able to pay their dues, so then obviously within a certain margin, obviously, it goes without saying that there wouldn't be people that have to spend more money because they're just covering really for others obviously notwithstanding programming and salaries and different things that relate to that, but specifics to carrying the burden of somebody else when somebody else doesn't carry that burden and they obligate you to do it, you feel that you're not carrying your weight. And it's more than that. In a situation of saving a person's life, you might, not, you might be, according to what we're learning, in violation, that person who does not carry the weight, they might be in violation of those Samad Adam Reicho. So it's not only they're just making you spend more money, but they're in violation of Allah and the Torah. But he does say, Amnam Zeh, source 14, Zerak b'mikrek hitzoni shu levanu yochel alzer of a borer a poshut she'ain ha'adam chayv lim kar beso. Obviously, a person doesn't have to sell their house. It's obvious, right? And all their belongings. V'chalasher lo lahatzil chole v'chadoyme. Why? Because she yesh rabim hamitzuyim lahatzil. Because we know that there are more people. Everybody has to do it. Everybody has to be available. It's not convenient. It's a little too costly. It's not the right time. I have a, a vacation that I'm planning. I have certain expenditures I'm planning on using monies for. No, no, no. That kishiyesh rabin hametsuyim lahatzil. That there's people that are available to do it. They might not want to do it, but they're available people to share the burden. So we understand. So there might be a situation, though, that uh, yeah, maybe if nobody else is around, so then he'd have that obligation to do it besides other people. But since that's so rare, it's not going to be a situation where he's going to have to carry that burden himself. It says that the obligation is the mitzvahs are incumbent on other people as well. person can't say, you know what? I am not interested in that mitzvah of Hatzalus Nefoshos. I'm not interested in the mitzvah of saving a person's life. I'm not interested in the mitzvah of, of uh, Pidgin Shvuyim. The love of Lausam Radam No, no, no. Just like I can try to cajole a person from a Chabadnik to make sure that somebody, some people put that tefillin on today, I still have an obligation likewise to make sure that a person follows the Torah scrupulously as best they can. That's true of, his, of its being related to Mitzvah's Asa, and it's true of how it's related to Mitzvah's Lose Asa as well. I don't want to do it. You don't have a choice not to want to do it. You have to do it. And that's what he says, Vizet Barur, Opashit, that's clear, and that's obvious. And finally, before we take some questions here, is that the rush, again, this was the famous rush in his commentary that if somebody doesn't have it, you have to still support and help that person. What's not stated in the rush is that the obligation's on everybody else. You know why? Because that's obvious. Because kol Yisrael Revim Zeb Zeb Mitzvah. We have an obligation to encourage other people or guarantors, other people to perform the mitzvahs. Like we have that obligation to perform the mitzvahs. So since everybody has the obligation to perform the mitzvahs, so if I don't have the money to pay for somebody else to their life to be saved for them to get the medical treatment that they need, so I have to share the burden with everybody else. It's our communal responsibility. It's not just my personal responsibility. Look at the source number 15 where relatives, he explains, can be compensated for medical expenses after the death of their sick, of their sick relative, which means that the Yarshim have to pay the relatives. Like it's not fair that, uh, you know, that relatives can be compensated for the medical expenses for the death. Of the, right? So it's not just that the, the, the relative, you know, that it's not just that the, the relative died. So the, the relatives, Yarshim, you can't just say that the relative, if that person would have been survived, would have been able to live through as the victim of that, whatever situation they were in. So then that person should get paid back. No, the rush says, no, no, no. Even the Yarshim, meaning monies are owed to that person or to that person's family. And therefore they can, for, should be medically, they should be compensated for the medical attention. So it seems clear, look at source 15, nearly, the Mahai Taima lo yafsidu. So it's, it, it's logical to me that they should not lose out just because the sick, sick person did not ex- instruct them to, to make these expen- expenses. The person who's on his, uh, on his eventual deathbed or he was sick in the, in the hospital before he died, he didn't say that there certain, should be certain expenses should be you know, c- carried out, certain directives were, were made. No, no, even if he didn't do that, 
It's a well-known practice, explains. That means it's well known that when a person is sick and that person is not able to care for himself or herself, that relatives try to find him a cure, right? Shakrovim, Mishtadlim, Laham Silo Rafua, right? Isn't that obvious? It's not that the, the people who are the relatives are gonna say, you know what? If he's able to help himself, so get let him, he'll get up and help himself. No, no, no. They're not able to help themselves. And it's like so silly we don't have to have this conversation. It's to be written here that Shakrova Mishtadlim Laham Si Lo Rafu, obviously. Bafilu Inish the Alma Shaya Mishtadl Laham Si Rafu Lachoila. Not only that, so that obviously we see that the relatives are going to do that. It's someone who's tried to find a cure for a sick person, even if the person did not direct to do so, that person should not lose money because it involves saving lives, which means it's even it's not the Chrome. Let's say you're a friend. Let's just say you're just a, a even if you're, you're anybody, we see that if a filo inish, the alma, inish the alma means that anybody, not just the Krovim. Krovim is the immediate people, his family members. But even if it's Krovim, it's not, not just Krovim, inish the alma, that person should not lose money. Why? Because this person's life is in danger. Says the Russian, anybody who is with alacrity, a person who is quick in the preservation of saving a person's life, their actions are considered a rizem meshubach, a zoriz, with alacrity, with precision. The person is quick and anxious, a rizem meshubach, lechein. And so therefore, if it is known through witnesses that someone laid out money while the sick relative was alive and it was not yet reimbursed, that person should be compensated by the estate of the orphans. Im yadua hadavar, that the means that the estate of the orphans is now essential to being sure that the person that the, that the person who died that there is a compensation that's even going to the relatives because even if it was that the relatives didn't spend money like what does that mean that they didn't spend money they would have spent money if they could have spent money so therefore there's money that's due and that money has to be paid so there's two sides of this there's how much money the rescuer has to pay and how much the victim and the victim's family is able to be compensated it's trying to marry those two concepts together so what you have now is just the idea a little bit drilled down a little bit deeper with a little bit more clarity i hope the idea that sure there are no limits on spending to save a person's life and where that might be daunting and fearful of somebody who would learn this topic to think that there's just no end in sight that a person could and has an obligation to give until they have nothing and then put themselves in a destitute state that's not the din that would be the din says Rav Asher Weiss that if it would be you'd live on an island and there's nobody else to do it and even if you don't live on an island and nobody else nobody else is willing to do it that does not exempt you from the obligation to do it you have to really try to cajole the people to do it and to join you in fact not only to cajole them to, to, to cajole them to do it to help you do it it's their duty it's their obligation it's their chiyuv to make sure it's their mandate to make sure that they assist you and to make sure that they are saving a person's life. So this is very important. So we see that there's no limits to it, that there are different authorities, Rav Yaakov Emden, the Aruch HaShulchan, the Chavetz Chaim, that one-fifth spending limit does not apply to saving a life. That only applies to tzedakah, to charity, but not to saving a life, someone who's truly in danger. Now again, that gray area of a person who's truly in danger, if maybe it's even argued that that person really is not in, in danger, so okay, that's a different conversation. But certainly if that person is suffolk danger, impossible danger, then that person's on the verge of death or a hungry person on the verge of death. So that one-fifth is not applicable uh, to that situation, okay? And we're going to obviously get into when a person puts himself into that situation, which we just alluded to very briefly, is that we see that there is such an opinion. So certainly if that means that you can put yourself, if there is even an opinion in such a situation where you're going to put your own life in danger, then certainly your wealth that you're going to put into danger, obviously, to save another person's life. And it's only in extreme rare cases, though, that... Uh, that would that a person will have to spend all of their money to save life, as I mentioned, because of the fact that clearly the obligation is on everybody else. Relatives can't be compensated for medical expenses, as the Rush said in source number 15 after the death of their sick relative, because that's money that's due to them. There's no way that relatives would choose to stand idly, passively, uninterestedly, and uninvolvedly because of the fact that they would try to do anything that they possibly could to get a cure for their relative who they had hoped would have survived. Okay, that sources what through 15. So I know it's a lot of material here. Questions, comments, concerns. Let's give a few minutes here to 
kind of get through some of these points. Yes, Dr. Seinfeld, you're, you're muted, Doc. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, Captain. Okay, uh, so this distinction that's being made between a mitzvah tase and a mitzvah lo tase, um, I would say that the mitzvah of lo tam od adam reyecha is a positive commandment because in order to fulfill this mitzvah, you have to do something. As a matter of fact, if you do nothing, you're in violation of the commandment. You can fulfill the mitzvah of lo tirzach by not killing anybody. Right. Lo tigno, if you don't kill somebody. The only way you could fulfill the mitzvah of lo tam od adam reyecha by actually doing something. It's, so to me, it's a positive commandment. Um, doing nothing is passive. You haven't fulfilled the mitzvah. It's, it's an interesting observation. It's, an, it's a very interesting observation because you're right. I'm, I'm struggling though with the language of the Rambam. If you look at source number six, the Rambam says, How do you understand that Rambam? Source number six at the end. He says that at the beginning of al Yudal and at the end. The beginning is, Kol hayachol lahatzil velo hitzil over al lo samud al damri echon. Now what does that sound like? That sounds like if he was able to do it and he didn't do it. So what, what does that mean? That's a, that's a, that's a, and then look at, the, look at the end of it. So he didn't do it. I don't, see, I don't see six. I have, I go from five to seven. Oh, I'm sorry. I got it. Okay. It's just interesting language because it, let's just take another positive mitzvah. Let's say the mitzvah of tzitzis, right? So if you don't wear tzitzis, are you over a lav? You didn't do it. Did you, are you in violation of a lav? No. no. And you, just, you just missed an opportunity. So this isn't just a missed opportunity that you should have saved somebody. You're over a lav. And that's the, we know that it's a lav because it's a low sam and aldam. You cannot. You shall not. Even though you're right, your observation is 100% right. Like how would you rectify that you have to do something so it seems to be that the distinction is that it really is a positive go up kum ase not shave al taise i'm just reading the language of the rambam i would i'm struggling with the language of the rambam to call this a mitzvah ase even though you're right you need to do something but maybe it's because you don't actually always need to do something maybe it's not i'll give you an example maybe just mask wearing for example Maybe you yourself, I'm not, nothing to do with saving somebody else in, a, in an active sense of telling them to do something. You're just doing something yourself. Lo mode means to stand by idly. You're not allowed to stand by idly. Yeah. Means, in fact, a mitzvah to say you have to take some kind of action. Right, that's what Dr. Seinfeld is arguing. But how do you yeah. read the I, I hear in the minion of mitzvahs of the Rambam, he listens as a love. This is not as an essay. Yeah. And that's, and that's the language. It, I, I, I agree. Losamod means like take a step forward and help somebody. <laughs> but that's a, that's a positive, engaging activity. So, and if you're, and if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're a samod and, and you don't move, losamod, like you don't do that. But if you did that, then you're over a love. It's a little confusing. It's a good point. No, it's an interesting point. I don't, I, I, I agree. I would agree with you. I just don't know how to read the Rambam otherwise. Do you have a good yeah. you know, chat in the Rambam? I don't know. I, and, I, and I think I he said it twice at the beginning of Halacha Vav, Yudal, and at the end. Um, I want to ask something about Rav Weiss, for example. Um, would you uh, give up your house in order to save a life? And Rabbi Weiss said, no, you wouldn't. He, he says yes and no. He says in, in well, an I, I didn't know. I, I was going to argue there, there are two answers you could give. I mean, essentially, if you lose your shelter, you, your family or whatever who counts on that for shelter, it's very possible you're putting your life and your family's life at risk. So that would be one way to explain it, I guess. The other one is if people were going to start losing their houses in order to save someone. Nobody no, would do it. Right. No, no one would do it. The question but, is, is to agree. What if it was a question of your car, let's say? Right. I mean, how do you evaluate those? Right, right. He gives the example of a house as, as an example that's maxim. He's like exaggerated because yeah. it's like uh, nobody would think that. You don't have to lose that. Would you have to lose some lower status things? Possibly. 
But mm-hmm. I think the point that he's accentuating is, is very simple, which is it's the burden not of the one, it's the burden of the many. And therefore don't think, right? Don't think that you'd have to fall into such a situation because it won't happen. Now, the sad reality is that it could happen. It could happen. Sid, what did you want to say? I'm sorry. Did you have your, were you? No. That, you Dr. Seinfeld, you're, you're bringing a good point. I just don't know how to read the Rambam. And I see in the minute. Well, I, 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 I just took time to read it now. And so he says, uh, you transgress a negative commandment. But he's kind of using circular reasoning because he's saying that you have to do something. And the only way to fulfill the mitzvah is actually to do something. So I view that as a positive commandment. You have to do something. That's how you fulfill the mitzvah. There's no way you could fulfill this mitzvah by doing nothing. You could pick up the phone and call 911. You could take out your checkbook. You could yell help. You could go in and you know save someone. But doing nothing is the one option that means you've violated the commandment. And then you, and then for what? Then you're over a love. You're, o, you're over a love, yeah. Right, so it's a love. It's not a, it's no, no, not I'm a, sorry. It's not a... if, you, if you do nothing, you're over on a positive commandment as far as I'm concerned, even though the word low appears in it. Right. There's no way you can fulfill this commandment by doing nothing. The only way to fulfill it is by doing something. It, it's it's circular. Yeah, I, I, I got to chew on that a little bit. It's true. I mean, it's it's undeniable what you're saying. Um, yeah. So let, let, right. Let's just say. Think. I'm just thinking about the the myths of Hashavas Aveda, for example. So you can okay. only you can only f- fulfill the myths of Hashavas Aveda if you find the lost article. Okay. Right? And you return it. And if you don't, you're in violation of. It's like you have to do it. You, you, there's there's no in between. You have to do it to fulfill it. And if you don't, you have a love, <laughs> you, you know, right? Well, what is the, well, I mean, is the commandment a love? The commandment is oh, to that's return the, right. right. Vashevosa low is not low. It's a positive if, commandment. If you didn't return it, you violated a positive commandment. Right. That's why I think this is different because it doesn't, I, even though the mechanics of it seem to be the same, but I don't think it's the same thing categorically. I Meaning the Rambam lists this in the loves, in the love, and not in the positive commands and the negatives. It's in the don'ts, not the do's. Now, obviously you have to, obviously you have to do something not to violate the don't. Correct. But maybe there is a situation where you don't have to do something. And therefore, right, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know what that situation would be, but if there did exist just as any situation where you don't have to do something, then that would answer the question. Right? I mean, in the case right. of Hashem, that you need something, you need a chavza to return. And if you don't, even though you found it, you're over, you're, you're over in a, a mitzvah saseh. Correct. Don't, don't stand by idly. Might not necessarily, even though it seems to be counterintuitive, it might not necessarily mean you have to do something. Even though all the examples in the Gemara is that if you see someone tovea b'yam, if you see some list, I mean, right? Is there a situation where you don't do something and that's the definition of Los Adam, of not being in violation of Los Adam Yecha. Now, it, it's a technicality, but it's an important. It's important. If, if there exists one scenario, then it makes sense. But I'm just curious. I'm, I'm going to have to. I'm going to go through the Rambam's right now. But again, I have to look at this. Why he lists this as a love, <laughs> not just because of low. I mean, that is one reason. But Los Adam Yecha, you cannot. You should not. If you did not help that person. You're over the love of, even even though the way you're able to vi- to, to 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 prevent that is by doing something. I, I you know how how would you phrase Lota Moda Damrayacha as Not a positive? Really. How would you phrase it as a positive command? Don't do you that. should. Yeah, how would you phrase it as a positive? Do something to help your fellow human being in distress. But that's something that's not like um, very specific. I mean, it doesn't have to be specific. It could include a wide range of actions that one could take. Right. So, so, but I think that could be a good point, which is, 
Katsilech Reyecha? Yeah. Okay. Meaning the defini definition of how you're not in violation of this love is to do something. But the Torah does not say that you have to actively go out and do something to save another person's life as a positive command. But right. the definition here, it's like so logical, but the definition here is, is to avoid being over a love. You have to do something. And that even though you're doing that, you, right? You don't, don't think you're so great for going out and doing it. I guess I, I guess we could say it that way. Like you have to do that. You have to go. So, and if you don't do it, you're over a love. Maybe just the, 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 the psyche of that is like, if you didn't do that, why would anybody choose to spend any of their money to help another person? It would have to be formulated as such as a positive commandment that you have to spend a certain amount. And it is, set, it is formulated that way when it comes to how much money you spend on a mitzvah, how much money you spend on it to give tzedakah, eat, right? This is how much you should give. And you don't have to give more than that, but this is how much you have to give. This is how much you have to spend. You don't have to spend more than that. That's just the parameters of what you have to give. For someone who's feeling very generous, okay, there's a limit to even how much generosity you're supposed to share. But that's just not the formulation here. Is love means you, should, you do not, lo samot means don't. And the way you don't is, a, is, a, is an activity that's engaging to how you do something. But I don't know if even though the mechanism is positive engagement, a physical movement, that's just the way it's done to, to, to be sure to it that you don't fall to the, to, to the precision of low sound mode. But I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to probably cancel my next half hour of what I was going to do and look into my roundups a little bit because it, it, it's Sorry. undeniable that he mentions that. What? Sorry. No, no, no. It's okay. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I'll get back to you. Same bad time, same bad channel. Any other questions, comments? Love learning Thank with you. Very um, much, right? Yeah, I have, I have a simple question, I think. Yes, Carol. Um, so, so I'm wondering then, you know how you, in the mail you get tons and tons of mail, this person needs money, this person needs money, save this person. Sure. So it almost sounds like you are supposed to actually respond to all of those in some fashion, even right. if it's a dollar, we'll say. Is that, yeah. is that what I'm understanding? Theoretically, theoretically, yes. But unfortunately, what's happened is that people have taken advantage of the knowledge of that and then what they've done is under the auspices of whether we call it the uh, Achnasas Orchim, you know, or Achnasas Kala, or wh whatever organization has kind of grabbed the main themes that will tug at your heart and make you feel that, that because of what they're petitioning to, to your heart that you should give to, that means you should you have an obligation to give it. So, so the answer is, is that unfortunately, because of the fact that people have taken advantage, we have not the obligation to just blindly give to every organization, we have the right to look into the authenticity of that organization. And I'm sad to tell you that whether it's a mailer or whether it's a, a, a person who comes to the shul to collect money and raise money. So they all come with a certificate and it's not my personality to check, do a background check. And I'm not saying that, you know, $1, you know, I was raised in home. We're just giving a dollar. Even if a, if a person is at such a level, they're going to do run around like that. So you give them a dollar. There's been a dollar and multi, you know, more. But even a dollar, you know, there have been many times, it's not my personality to check the, two, the, the certificate of authenticity. But I'm sad to tell you that there have been a few times, whether it's people coming to the shul or other organizations, you check the certificate of authenticity and then you find out that it's no, not so authentic. So because there are people that are circulating around, I always tell people that you have, you have your right to do some due diligence if you, you know, can. And you could, it's not so hard today. You make a couple phone calls to see the mailers, the ask, the organizations. I mean, just because it, you, you could be someone who's now on everybody's list and now you could literally feel obligated to give to everything. There's a limit to how much charity you have to give. And there's a limit to, you know, even the organizations when you're talking about saving a life, like, so once you get on the, 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 the you're on the charity list of people who save lives, now you could get mailers every day, multiple people, multiple causes. So some of them might be correct. And sometimes, unfortunately, some of them are not true. And remember that that obligation is never on the single singular person. So I always want to know, you know, and it's not the best example, but I know like somebody uh, texted me last night, if I could daven for him for something that he, that he needs, whatever. So I said, sure, as long as I see you at Mincha also, I'm happy to daven for you. So if the mailer goes out to me and I'm expected to be the only one to do it, my, one of my first questions is like, how many people are supporting this and how many people are involved in this? And like, like you're allowed to ask questions. And the second it starts to have a scent of, disingenuousness, then 
obviously. The, yeah, the other question, question I would that makes have. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. Low sure. Low sure. is it like an individual thing. When I see a solicitation, get in the mail, see an ad on TV or something else, like Carolyn mentioned, my dollar, my $10, my $20 that I send in, how do I know that that is going directly to save a life? Right, right. It might be to cover overhead. That's tough. Even if it's That's a tough. legitimate place. I mean, is, right. is that, is, is, does that make it a few to give? Um, you have the right to ask where your monies are going. You know, I know people that, that, that support national organizations. The case has been made um, by a number of, you know, uh, halachic sources that if you're paying for overhead, it's allowing those other monies to pay for the saving of the life. So you get the credit. You don't have to know how that check was cashed. Well, like, you like to know, like I like to know, that if I'm giving $100, that it's going to the mouth of the person who needs it. But, it, but the organization is allowing the, the, the money to get to the people that, well, uh, that need it. Well, I, I, to me, the question is whether, in fact, uh, Lotam Mod of Damriecha has to do with directly saving a life. Well, I'll tell you why I agree. I mean, is, is what, what, what is the like, What's enough to me to say? I'll tell you what I think. A good, I'll, give you, I'll give you a good example. I think coronavirus is a good example. Like you, we, we have no idea. Like if you're wearing a mask, theoretically, like whose life are you saving? Do you, do you have to know whose life you're saving? You actually have to act a certain way, even if you don't know the life of the person you're saving. Everybody has all these cheshbonos. All, everybody has all these like calculations. Ah, the antibodies. And if you're in a certain category, everybody's like a doctor, a statistician. And the answer is, is like, we don't know. And so therefore we're being advised to act a certain way to protect even a person that we don't know. So that's, it's, it actually goes even beyond, literally just beyond, you know, what, what you can even see before you. That's why we have an obligation. I believe extends to what we're living through right now. Is that if you're going to act in a certain way, that's going to put other people's life in danger, then that's a big problem. It's a big problem. So, love your questions. Love learning with you all. Thank you for the time together. Next week, same bad time, same bad channel. I wish everybody a blessed and a beautiful day. All right. Thank, Thank you, you. Rabbi.